Well, I love it that she's singing before she even knows the words. We will be getting back into the, the Gospel of Matthew next week, but this morning we're celebrating something special in the life of a church. We are celebrating the deacon ministry. And we will be celebrating the deacon ministry of Thompson Town Baptist Church. One reason we are doing that is because in a little bit we'll ordain a new deacon here at Thompson Town Baptist. But as I thought about, you know, how, how do we do that? How do we ordain a deacon? I really wanted to celebrate the ministry of the deacon in the church. I wanted to celebrate the deacon ministry as a whole because a good deacon ministry is vital to the health of a local church. A good deacon ministry is vital to the health of a local church. So while Bob Dressler is going to be ordained this morning, this is not just a message for Bob. Not even just a message for the deacons. This is a message to the entire church to consider and rejoice in the work of the deacon ministry. And to help us do that, we're going to consider the, the place of the deacon ministry in the church, as a church office. We're going to consider the function of the deacon ministry in the church. And we're going to consider just who we should have serving in the ministry of the deacon as a church. And we're going to do all of that so that we can pray better for and support our deacons in their ministry. But before we do all of that, I think it's important that we pray. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we're going to be looking into your word now. God, we, we want to hear from you about this ministry, the ministry of the deacon. Lord, we... We want this office in our church to be the office you would have it to be. We want to receive the blessing that you intend for us to receive through this office at work in our church. We want to support the men who serve in this office as you would have us support them. So Lord, I pray that you would speak to us from your word this morning that you would make it clear to our minds, that you would do your work in our hearts, that we might believe your word and trust your word and obey your word, that you might be glorified. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So again, this, this morning, as we celebrate the office of the deacon and celebrate the men who have served well as deacons and ordain Bob into the ministry of the deacon, we're going to consider the office of the deacon, and we'll do that three ways. Um, now, we won't be looking at just one passage either this morning. As we, we look at these three things about the, the office of the deacon, what we're going to do is we're going to look at three different passages. But what I want us to do is begin here. The office of the deacon is one of the two biblical church offices. The office of the deacon is one of two biblical church offices. And we'll just look at one verse for that. If you look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul opens his letter to the church in Philippi with a very typical Paul, from me to you. Right? But here's how he says it. This is a letter from Paul and Timothy, and he identifies them as slaves of Christ or servants of Christ. The word is literally slaves. And it's a letter to the church in Philippi, to the Christians in Philippi, the church, along with the overseers and deacons. So Paul is first of all writing to every Christian in the church. This letter is to the church that meets in Philippi. But as he writes to the church, he singles out. He singles out two groups of men within the church. 
The whole church needs this word, but these men need this word especially because of their role in the church as officers in the church. So he writes to the church together with the overseers and deacons. And we want to consider who these men are. Who are the overseers and deacons? Well, the, the first group, the overseers, what the, the King James Version, which ties its translation to the Church of England when it was written, calls bishops. But we would better understand them as overseers. These overseers are also called elders. Overseers are elders. For example, Paul tells Timothy to set overseers over the ministry of the word in the church, but he tells Titus to set elders over the ministry of the word in the church. Now, he's not telling Timothy to do something that he's different than he's telling Titus to do. These are two different titles for the same office, elder and overseer. And overseer elders can also be called pastors. Pastors. And the word pastor, if we actually translated that word, means shepherd. It means shepherd. And they can be called that because there are passages in the Bible, like 1 Peter chapter 5. In 1 Peter 5, the first two verses, he says, I exhort the elders among you as fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd or pastor, the flock of God that is among you. So he tells the overseers to pastor. So overseer, elder, pastor is one name for the same, there are three names for the same office. For the same office. They're overseers because they oversee the spiritual life of the church. That's why they're called overseers. They are elders because they lead the teaching ministry of the church, just like the elders in the Jewish synagogue led the teaching ministry of the synagogue. So they're overseers and elders and they're pastors because like shepherds, God has given them the role of shepherding, protecting and feeding God's flock. So the first specific group that Paul calls out in Philippi are these, these overseers, the pastors. The second group, though, is the one we're looking at this morning. The second group singled out in Philippians are the deacons. The word deacon literally means servant. Literally means servant. The word deacon was used to describe servants before there ever was an office in the church. Just like the church needs men who will lead the church by overseeing the spiritual ministry of the church, we need men who will lead the church in service, in the service, the work of serving. Now let's be clear about this, just like Paul was. The office of the pastor is different than the office of the deacon. A deacon's not a pastor and a pastor's not a deacon. They're different, but they are both absolutely necessary for the health of the church. You need the leadership of pastors in the spiritual realm and deacons in the service ministry of the church for the church to be healthy. We'll talk more about how deacons do what deacons do in a moment, but we need to see something in this passage. God has a design for His church that, that includes pastors and deacons. God has a design for His church. He didn't leave us in the dark as to what He wanted our churches to be organized like. The church is made up of all the saints who gather. That's very clear. Every member of the church matters. And sometimes to 
When I, when I speak of the offices of the church to illustrate the importance of the gathered church, I'll even talk about the gathered church as a third office because the church has a certain authority of its own. But God's design for the church includes in the church two offices of men in the church, the office of the pastor and the office of the deacon. And each of these offices has a leadership role in the church. Two different leadership roles. But for now, what we need to pin down, two biblical offices, pastor and deacon. And this morning, we're going to be digging deeper into the office of deacon. But I guess first I need to deal with the word I've been throwing around all morning. Office. What does it mean that the deacon is an officer in the church. What is an office? Well, there are only two biblical offices, pastor and deacon, so that gives us a good idea kind of what we're talking about. Um, though in our church, we, 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 you know, if you dig out your constitution and bylaws, which I'm sure you do on a regular basis, right? You'll find we have other offices. But we have biblical offices, pastor and deacon, but we also have administrative offices. Clerk, treasurer, business offices. We have trustees. That's a legal office. Um, they handle corporate and legal relationships. The clerk keeps the records up to date. The treasurer makes sure our finances are in order. But there are two biblical offices that are necessary for us to be a church, right? You can join any nonprofit, and it's going to have trustees, clerks, right? But they, they won't have pastors and deacons. Those are church offices. And, and, and what an office is, is a position where God has called someone to lead in this area. That's what these offices are. And we should celebrate that God has given us men to fill these biblical offices. That is a gift from God. When, when God gave his church a little bit of an org chart, it is a great blessing when God gives the church men to fill out that org chart. Because if God wants the church to have pastors and deacons and you don't have men to be pastors and deacons, you have something missing. So the office of the deacon is one of two biblical church offices. It is an office in the church. But we also need to see that the office of the deacon has two basic biblical functions. There are two basic biblical functions in the office of the church. And to see that, the best place to look is Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, and I'm going to read from there, so you might want to go there in your Bible. And I'll start in verse 1 in Acts 6. It says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. All right, now, in, in the church this morning, there may be some of you who can name all 12 of Jesus' disciples. If you can, I'm very impressed. But I am really impressed if you can name all seven of the first deacons. Right? 
We just don't think about that. But I tell you what, this is an important moment in the life of the church right here. In Acts, in Acts 6, this is a crucial moment because we, we start off with the number of disciples is increasing and then we have an event which threatens that. And then we end up with, and they increased even more. Right? So this is a crisis event in the life of the church. The apostles, that, that's the twelve, the apostles are, are Jesus-ordained men to the office of apostle, which we have no more in the church, and I'm not going to cover that this morning. But the apostles were God's men who brought the new covenant word of God to the church. And, and they're there ministering in the church, and there's a huge disruption in the practical ministry of the church. There was an accusation of racial discrimination in the widow ministry of the church. The, the Jewish-speaking Greeks said, our widows are not being, being treated like the Jewish widows. And when this came up, the apostles heard this and said, look, we shouldn't give up our word ministry. So what you need to do, church, you need to set apart, which we might call ordaining, you need to set apart seven men to lead the church in dealing with this mess. And these seven men are the prototype of the deacon ministry. The relationship between the apostles as ministers of the word and these seven men who dealt with a practical ministry issue to preserve the unity and ministry of the church, the relationship between the apostles and these seven men is the model for the relationship between the pastor and the deacons in each local church. The pastors are the men who minister the word. They're to lead the spiritual ministry of the church. And the deacons are men who deal with practical ministry issues to preserve the unity of the church. Like the apostles needed these men to help in this area in Jerusalem, every church needs men like these. Every church needs men like these. Every church needs deacons. And the deacons matter so much that Paul, writing to Philippi, singled them out in the same line as pastors. The church needs both offices. Every church needs deacons. That means, as I said earlier, the, the ministry function of the deacons is essential for healthy church life. Every church needs men who can lead the church in ministry. I mean, this was feeding widows. That's ministry. But lead the church in ministry in a way that blesses the people in the ministry, but also keeps the church together for the sake of her mission. Keeps the church together for her mission. So let, let, let me just kind of dig a little deeper into those functions of the deacon. Because in Acts 6, the first thing we see is that these seven men took the lead in dealing with a very practical ministry issue, right? They were not called to solve a doctrinal issue. They were not called to determine how the church should worship. They were not called to lead a prayer meeting or teach a class. They were called to make sure all of the widows were being taken care of and there was no racial discrimination dividing the church. They were called to get, make this work. Literally feeding women with food. That's as practical as you get. The ministry of the deacon is about leadership in the practical ministries of the church. One focus of, of the deacon ministry is, is indeed to be this kind of thing, caring for those in need. Our deacons administer a benevolence fund so that when brothers or sisters in Christ are in need and we can financially help them out, the deacons step up and do that. Because that's one part of this practical ministry thing, caring for the real needs of the saints. 
But taking care of practical ministry needs is not the only thing we see these deacons do. Because honestly, if it was just a matter of getting the right plate of food to the right woman, they wouldn't have needed to be this qualified. Would they? Right? The ministry of feeding widows could have been done by, by anybody with, a, I don't know, a cart and some sack lunches. But what we see here is that these seven men dealt with the ministry issue in a way that restored the unity of the church so she could be on mission. The ministry of feeding widows was dividing the church in, a Jerus in Jerusalem in a way that would have damaged the spread of the gospel. Racial lines were drawn in the church. Gentile, I mean, Greek-speaking Jews. Might have got that backwards last time. Greek-speaking Jews, church members, believed that because of their race, or their Greek-speaking, that their widows were not being ministered to in the church that their widows were not loved in the body of Christ the same way Jewish widows were loved in the body of Christ. If this issue doesn't get resolved and the church splits and we've got the church of the Greek-speaking Jews and the church of the Hebrew-speaking Jews, what is that going to do to the spread of the gospel into a lost and dying world here at a crucial moment in the beginning of the church. These seven men are called to lead in a practical ministry to, to unite the church, to bring unity to the body of Christ. Deacons are unity men. The seven men in Acts 6 had to tackle a food ministry problem and much more. They had to bring peace where there was strife. The ministry of the deacon is to be a practical ministry that includes caring for those in the church who have practical needs and working for church unity for the sake of the gospel. Friends, that is no small thing to task men to do. To work for church unity in the ministry of the churches for the sake of the gospel. So basically stated, the biblical functions of the office of the deacon are to serve and to unite the church. Now think about, think about how that works though in association with the other office in the church. With the office of the pastor in the ministry of the word. The Word of God calls the church to, to worship, to serve, and to witness. But, but church members are people with opinions. You know that, right? <laughs> and they're not always the same opinion, are they? And, and they will surely have different opinions on, on how to worship and serve and witness. How gracious of God then... To say, we, I will create a second office in the church that will work through the ministries of the church to keep the church together on point so the church can then spread the gospel into a lost and dying world. Men gifted and called to lead the church to be a church that serves and cares in such a way that brings the church together in unity. That is a gift from God. The deacon ministry is a gift from God when it functions in these two ways. The office of the deacon is, is one of two biblical offices. It has these two basic biblical functions, service and unity. And the office of the deacon has two basic biblical qualifications. In Acts 6, it was clear that the, the first seven deacons... I mean, we, we look right there in the passage, had to be men of good reputation, good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom. It was necessary that these be respected men who are godly and wise. 
respected, godly, wise men, if they're going to repair this breach, right, if they're going to step into this mess and somehow bring the church back together, they're going to need godliness and wisdom and a good reputation. Friends, deacons were never just table waiters. I, I, I hate it when I hear that in a sermon. The word deacon was used to describe table waiters, but that has nothing to do with the office of the deacon. The deacons were always more than guys who passed plates. They were men who were respected men in the church, who were godly and wise, who could step into a mess like this and keep the church together so she could stay on mission. Godly, wise men whom the church trusts. That's a really good summary of the detailed list of qualifications that we find in 1 Timothy. So you might want to take your Bible and, and turn to 1 Timothy. It's in chapter 3. And in 1 Timothy, we, we see that, that good reputation, godliness, and wisdom spelled out in a little more detail, starting at verse 8. It says, Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons, if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Instead of looking at those qualifications one by one, I want to just group them together. Just like we see in the, the ministry qualifications of the pastor earlier in 1 Timothy 3, we see that deacons are to be men of character. They're to be men of godly character who lead their families well. They're not greedy and they're not drunkards. That's a good picture of their, their character. They lead their family well. They're not greedy and they're not, they're not drunkards. Just like pastors, same qualification. Both pastors and deacons are also to be honest, sober, generous men, respected by the church. Both pastors and deacons are to be one woman men. They are to be devoted to their wives. Both pastors and deacons are to be devoted fathers, raising their children up to follow the Lord. See, that, that's true of, of both of these ordained ministries. Those parts are the same, but there are differences in the qualifications, and they have to do with the function. A, a couple of the qualifications of the pastor in 1 Timothy are absent in the qualifications for the deacon. The, the, the pastor has to be a mature Christian so that as the man up front, he doesn't become arrogant. He has to be mature enough that he doesn't become arrogant. That's not said of the deacon because the deacon is not the man up front teaching and preaching. He's, he's, the deacon is the one serving behind the scenes, leading in the ministry of the church. Likewise, some of the deacon qualifications are unique to the deacon, not included in the qualification of the pastor. In verse 9, the deacon must hold to the gospel with a clear conscience. The deacon must be a man whose godliness closet is not filled with any ungodliness skeletons that are going to come up and ruin the deacon ministry. Okay, if you're sending a man to deal with a crisis in the church, getting ministry to work and the church to come together, do you want a man who's suddenly going to be found out for his sins? No. You don't. He must hold to the gospel with a clear conscience. He's a man shaped by the gospel. Verse 10, the deacon must be a tested man. If you're going to have a man lead you in your, your practical ministries, 
He needs to be a man who has been busy in practical ministries. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? In verse 11, the deacon's wife must be a certain kind of woman. She must be a faithful woman of a godly character who can be trusted. These qualifications are, are unique to the deacon because deacons lead the church in practical acts of service. They can't be men with, with those hidden sins. They need to show that they serve before they lead in service. And they must have godly wives because in a way that's not true of the pastor, the deacon's wife very well may join him in his ministry work because he's working in service. I'm not going to bring Debbie up to help me preach on Sunday. And that's why that doesn't show up in the qualification for the pastor's wife. But in the deacon's ministry, in the work of service, there very well may be instances where his wife may need to come alongside him. So the biblical qualifications for the office of deacon are qualifications built around godliness in character and service and tied to the function of the deacon. What an incredible gift of God it is then if he has put men like that in our church. Is that not kind of him to give us men that you could describe like this? What an incredible gift of God. Now, deacons are not perfect men. I know your deacons. Some of you are married to them. You know they are not perfect men. That's not what this says. But they will be men who pursue godliness in their character as a regular part of their life. They will be men who care about serving in the church. And they will be men who care about the unity of the church. That's the kind of men they will be. And they will show themselves to be deacons before we ever call them deacons. That's the kind of men that, that you have in the church when you have a deacon ministry. And praise God, we have deacons. I hope as church members you can say, praise God, we have deacons. I can tell you as a pastor, it, it, it is something I can say, praise God, we have deacons. Because there are two biblical offices in the church. The church does not just need a pastor. The church needs deacons. And the biblical functions of that office of the deacon are so important to lead us to serve in ways that bring us together and keep us on mission, service and unity. And the qualifications of the deacons to be godly in character and service, it, it, it's amazing that God would bless us in such a way to give us those men. With that in mind, this morning we're going to close our, our, my sermon time, at least, a little differently. We're going to close our service by ordaining a man into the deacon ministry. Um, there won't be a great deal of pomp involved here because ordination is to be set apart to a ministry of service. <laughs> But what we're going to do is this. Um, back on December 10th, in our business meeting, the gathered members of the church voted to approve adding Bob Dressler to the deacon ministry of the church. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to reaffirm that decision by a vote of the members. So in a minute, I'll call for a vote. I will ask that only those of you who are members of the church vote when I do that because that's part of your authority in the office of the congregation. But we will be voting to ordain. Hopefully that's just a reaffirmation of the vote we took on December 10th because I don't know of anything that has changed about Bob since then. But in this vote, what we're doing, we are recognizing that while he is a sinner saved by grace like the rest of us, Bob has been gifted and called by God to this deacon ministry. So following that vote then, I'm going to ask all the other ordained men of the church, pastors and deacons, to go gather around Bob. We're not going to make him come up front because that's not a deacon thing. We're going to go gather around Bob and we're going to 
have a time of prayer for Bob as he enters the deacon ministry. But this isn't just a morning I don't think about Bob. I think it's, we want to celebrate the whole deacon ministry. So after we do that, then I'm going to ask those men to return to their seats. I'm going to have all of our active deacons stand up, and I'm going to ask you as a church to gather around our active deacons, and we're going to have a time of prayer for our deacons. And then we'll close our service in, in the normal way with our, our invitation and closing words. But first, what I want us to do is, is have a vote to uh, affirm that decision to or set apart Bob Dressler for the deacon ministry. And, and I'm not going to do it with paper. We're going to do it by affirmation. So those of you who are members and, and you affirm calling Bob into the deacon ministry, let it be known by saying aye. Those opposed by no, the eyes have it. Bob, we want you. All right? We want you to serve as a deacon. Um, so that is the vote to affirm. Now I want to ask the, the other ordained men, deacons and pastors, so I'm calling you to join us, Caleb, even though you're just visiting. I want you to gather around Bob. Ben, they're wireless. Going, Deacon Chairman, <laughs> to, to lead us in a time for prayer. Let's lay hands up, Bob, and let's pray for Bob. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for Bob's willingness to uh, serve you and serve us here in the church. We just pray your hand on him as we have our hands on him, Father. We just ask that you would be with him, bless him and his family, just protect him from, uh, from all the evil that's in this world. And Father, help us to uh, walk alongside him and uh, serve this church. And we pray this in uh, your name. Amen. Amen. So now I'm going to ask that our active serving deacons, if you would stand, and I'll ask the church to gather around those men, and we'll lay hands on these men. We're not ordaining them again. We're just praying for them. But if you would do that, please gather around these men. Of course, now everybody's standing up, so it's confusing, isn't it? And I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we recognize this morning that you have blessed the church by giving the church the office of deacon. God, we thank you that in your wisdom you saw the, the need that we would have for men who would lead us in this kind of ministry. And we thank you also, God, that in your grace and your mercy to Thompson Town Baptist Church, you have raised up men to serve in the office of deacon. Lord, I, I thank you for all the men who, who throughout the years have served this church in the office of deacon and done it well. Lord, many of them have, have served well and, and, and gone home to be with you. We thank you for those brothers who served you so well in their time as deacons here at Thompson Town Baptist Church. But Lord, I also thank you for these men who are currently serving as deacons. God, I, I thank you for the example of their lives. Lord, that, that we have men that we could say we recognize and respect as godly wise men to lead us in this ministry. God, what a blessing it is for 
for you to have given to us as a church these men. We thank you for them. Lord, but we also recognize their work is not easy. For God, the, the work of the church in, in, a, in a world that is still filled with evidence of the fall is hard. God, sometimes we as church members are, are, are not at our best and we need these men to step in and help us to, to unite us in our service. Lord, we pray, dear God, that you would bless these men in their ministry as deacons, especially in this coming year. Lord, give them all the wisdom they need to lead us. Give them all of the strength they need to serve. Lord, bless their families. Bless their wives. As, as a deacon's wife is often called to, to deal with things in the life of the church that she would not have had to deal with had her husband not been a deacon. Lord, bless them. Bless their children and their grandchildren. Lord, bless their families as they serve. I pray that these children and these grandchildren would be able to look up to these men as deacons and as their father and their grandfather and say, I am so proud to say that, that my father, my grandfather is serving the church as a deacon. Lord, we thank you and we pray your blessings on these men. In Jesus' name, amen.